This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus. Jesus himself directed his most searing and vitriolic rebukes and denunciations against those who were supposed religionists, but who were like whitewashed tombs, who were outwardly clean but inwardly filthy, against the sort of facile, outward, superficial religion which doesn't have a profound inward alteration of heart. The important thing is that a person has, if he has his given three score years and ten, a choice regarding what he's going to be loyal to, what he's going to serve. Jesus said no man can serve two masters. He either hates one and loves the other or holds fast to one and despises the other. And this choice of what loyalty a person is going to live his life by is the most important one he ever makes. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> she has no more to say. <laughs> I have no opinion. <laughs> What'd you say? What happens if you don't believe in everything about Jesus Christ? Believe so you believe something else, some other deity. I believe that God is an all-merciful, powerful, just, forgiving God. But if a person is reared in a culture and in a land where sociologically and religiously he's never heard teachings of Jesus, I don't think God is going to condemn that person. He's going to foster that person's spiritual development. I think he is a God who is a father and who looks upon the people on this planet as children of his and loves his sons and daughters, all of them. And that's the most important thing about God. That's why Jesus 152 times in the New Testament in the four Gospels called God by that name Father because he's approachable. Live by the Christian ethic. Live by the Christian ethic? I would say, what'd you say? No, I don't agree with that. If the whole ideal, I would agree with her, if a person's ideal is simply the golden rule, which according to one historian of religion is found in all of the 11 living religions on this earth today, the golden or silver rule either positively phrased, you shall do to another person as you would have him do to you, or negatively, as he calls it the silver rule, don't do to somebody else what you wouldn't want him to do to you, is found in all of those eleven religions. A person can hold that ethical ideal and still not have the power to live it, but it's by this inward infilling of spiritual said, energy in his... Ethic, not believing it or hearing it, I said living it. He doesn't even have to hear of any golden rule and he can still, you know, go around treating people as he's supposed to. He will still, in my opinion, go to this uh, heaven somewhere up there. A person can be drawing on spiritual power without calling it by the same name. In English, we call water water. In Spanish, it's agua. But you can drink it if you're thirsty. What did you say? <laughs> oh, I thought I had an amen coming from over that corner. <laughs> uh, in any case, it's water. And if you're thirsty, you can drink it and your thirst will be quenched. In the same way, people have different theological ways of talking about spiritual experience, but they can be having the same spiritual experience, and the experience is the important thing. I wouldn't dicker over semantics, vocabularies, creeds, catechisms, and theologies, but I would say that man can find this joyous experience of living as a son of God and a member in the Father's family. Are you experiencing God right now? Yes. Are you aware of it while talking? While talking, yes. You're doing two things at once. Yes. Consciously communicating with us and consciously uh, experiencing God. Yes, that's also how I play the guitar, in that my left hand knoweth not what my right hand doeth, yes. Are your eyes really that blue, or are they contacts? They're really that blue. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're, they're contacts, too. My stained glass contacts for spiritual occasions such as this. Did you have another question? <laughs> no, uh, but uh, well, when you're experiencing God, uh, is it going on simultaneously with God experiencing you? Yes, I would say so. And let me say what I mean by experiencing God. It would be very strange if a person had to be thinking about God all the time to be experiencing Him. In other words, if the moment you started to do something in trigonometry or were making a measurement in the chemistry lab, that suddenly you would lose consciousness of God, all this joy, this inward happiness and peace would suddenly go fleeing out to somewhere in the cosmic realms and you, and, you, and you would be theoretically out of contact. Well, that's not the way it happens, that there's this substratum, this continual joy and peace of knowing God, no matter what you're doing, and it never leaves. Yes, although in some times it's uh, to a greater degree than others, I would admit that. A greater consciousness. It's the consciousness that varies. It's our consciousness, it's not God's presence that varies that much. Yes, I agree with you. So this can happen all the time. I think that's nonsense. I think that the, the, uh, what you're saying is, is a confusion. What I'm doing is saying what my experience is. Other people's experience may vary. Mine is that a person can have, that I can have, and do have, this inward certainty and experience of the love and the joy and the peace of God no matter what else I'm doing. In other words, it doesn't fluctuate up and down. It doesn't come and go. But it's a continual thing. 
and it does not. Well, I, what I'm saying is that uh, that I think that's. Uh, <laughs> I think that's impossible, but I'm doing it, huh? No, that not, not that you're not doing it. That you think you are. I mean, that you. It makes me very happy. Whatever it is, I think I'm doing. <laughs> sure, you can be in a very good state and be doing various things. But the more you become involved in uh, in complex, in manipulating complex structures between people in the environment, mathematics, anything, the the more you have to concentrate on that, the 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 more you project the self outside of the self, and the more. Uh, you get away from the inner source, the Godhead. Let me give an illustration. I can be breathing all the time I'm doing anything, whether I'm studying. Sure. Are you going to tell me that you are aware all the time that you're breathing? That's followed logically. On some level of my consciousness, according to the physiologists, okay. my medulla oblongata is continually aware of the fact that I'm breathing because it's, in fact, the portion of my brain which is regulating and keeping me breathing. And therefore, I'm saying that... You mean to say that some... I do. Yeah. What, what's this talk about some level of your consciousness? In my experience is that I have this awareness, this consciousness of the love of God, of being a child of God in the same sense that I see you as a son of God and of God. infinite value. What? What's God? The father of all human beings. What, what does that mean? You know, father is like my father? It means that he loves you, for one thing, yeah, infinitely. He does, but what, you know, what is he, you know, if you can refer to him, you know, if you have a, you know, what are you talking What does the word God mean to me? What does it mean? What does God mean? I believe that God is the first source and center of all things and beings, the creator, controller, and infinite upholder of all reality, that God is the sustainer, that God is the sovereign, eternal, immortal, invisible deity. How's that for a starter? <laughs> That's pretty amusing, yeah. <laughs> when you say, when you say, Did you say amusing? Why so? Yeah. Why uh, amusing? Oh, I don't know. I'm a little <laughs> slow today. Sober. Let me go back to the one simple word then. That God is the father of all human beings, and that's the most important one. If I had to narrow down all those other words, I would narrow it down to the one that man can know God as a child knows his father. Yes? God is a sovereign power over all the universe. Yes. In other words, he controls all life. He sustains all. Does he punish the sinners? God has given man free will, in my judgment, and a person can make the choice to live well or to live evilly if he wants to. God is this cat who just, just uh, hangs out and sort of surveys the situation and uh, watches, uh, you know, sort of like the Joker, you know, people playing around, and you know, if they do good, well, that's groovy for them, you know. No sweat off of his back, you know. If they do evil, well, there's no hell anyway, so man has free will. So, you know, where does God come into this whole thing? Where does he have any uh, relevance or anything? That a person has an individual choice concerning where his allegiance and loyalty lies, and the supreme choice of all human life, in my judgment, is to serve God, to believe by faith that you're a son or a daughter of God, and live that way, and I offer that as the best I know of God. Do you think everybody has, even the dumb people, say most Americans, everybody has a free will? Do, um, does all of these, uh, these people out there, the, the people that don't even know where their heads are at, do they have free will? They have free will that they can begin seeking for spiritual truth, if they will choose to. And Jesus said one time, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened, ask and you will receive, and I believe that's true. It really okay, well, what are you seeking? What door is, uh, do you want to have open for you? I have sought for God and found God. I can say this is my honest experience, and it's a joyous thing and I would share it. I'm not trying to get anybody to sign a card or join an institution or throw money into a plate or something. But I'm saying that anyone can find this, you may find it, and call it by entirely different words. But it's the greatest experience you can know. Let me get to my fundamental point. I think if individual people are personally changed and find this spiritual relationship, discover their sons and daughters of the living God and all this, then they're going to treat other people and want to treat other people as members in one universal worldwide family. But until people want this, until that's their inward motivation, we really can't expect the planet to be living as one family. No, wait, 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 I'm trying to get to this, uh, well, I say we're all children of God. That's groovy, I could say the same thing myself. Do you believe it? In a sense, yeah, but I'm not sure if, you know, if I agree with you, like, uh, you know, uh, what are you saying, that uh, people can change, you know? That the most important change is the change of individuals. I'll give you an example. Winston Churchill once said that ultimately the fate of nations depend on the digestive system of a prime minister on a given night. What I'm saying is that every great decision that's ever made on this planet is finally, ultimately, made by an individual or a small group of individuals. If individuals can change, if the spiritual renaissance takes place in the lives of people, if people yield their supreme allegiance to God and serve God, what? you see this happening. I see that it can happen. I see the dawn of it. I've seen individual people changed and their behavior changed. And This is a belief on your part. It's a conviction. It's my faith. Well, what if you don't have a job? Uh, you live in, in, in a, a sort of a 
tenement house and you're suicidally depressed, how are you going to, you know, do you really expect somebody in that state the in uh, to, to, to seek God is all loving? The entire hope. The entire message of what Jesus was talking about is that man can change. That whatever a person's situation outwardly and inwardly, God can change a person inwardly to the point that he discovers he's a son of God. He's still starving. He may have outward physical problems. If you will hold that image in your mind that you're a son of God, a child you of mean, the mean, Father. Uh, that I am, in essence, a God's son, in other words, a, a, almost a God. Is that what you're saying in a way? Jesus one time said to be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. That means be godlike. Yes, I believe man can become could, like God. Could, yeah, I, th I think he is a God that a person can know. I believe that. Anyway. Hold it, hold it. Now, how can a father maintain uh, completely objective about his son? Don't you think that God gets subjective? He's not. God gets subjective. He does. Well. He loves and, us. And That's the most about, subjective thing about God. Job, <laughs> God I've got a question. How is the average person supposed to know what is... Uh, uh, image, you know, poetic imagery, and what is just, you know, the truth in the Bible? I would say that the way a person can recognize spiritual truth, the average, truth, how, the how average, the average person know? can recognize spiritual truth God. by what it says to their personal lives. You can read a lot of things masquerading in the name of religious ideas, religious and theological teachings, which really don't have much to do with your life. But when you come across something such as do to another as you would have that person do to you, the loving nature of God about man's purpose and destiny on this planet and in this universe, that which really speaks and makes life more meaningful and gives a person a more exalted philosophy of life, understanding of himself and other human beings, that is very valuable and that you can recognize that as truth and you can live it out. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701 and ask for the booklet, Questions University Students Ask. It offers simple, understandable answers to some of the most perplexing questions confronting modern humankind. Who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? The title of this free booklet, containing transcripts of unrehearsed, spontaneous question and answer sessions on campus, is Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God getting to know God and growing spiritually about the processes of inward discovery and adventure, the new power and purpose potential for every human life. Another free piece of literature is Freedom from Fear. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again, Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California. C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A 94701 USA When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. <laughs>